So just one thought that struck me from Father Brendan's uh, conversation was, like all of us here are, are, are willing to make, make sacrifices. Um, and as you said, a soldier is, is one who's willing to pay, put his life, um, that, that's his primary role, and lay his life on the line for his country. But we also know that soldiers, um, when they were being encouraged to head out to war, there was also the promise that there was something there, there was a reason to make these sacrifices. There was, as the, to put it in the old terms, spoils of war to be had. Um, I think one of the complaints made by um, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the 20th century was grace and salvation and everything had become cheap. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to make the sacrifice because it could be given to you. Do you see that as a, as a problem for us as we, as we sort of like inspire men to, to step up? Uh, I do, yeah. I'm, I'm particularly... Uh, my nephew is here tonight and I have another nephew and two nieces. And I, it, It's hard for the young Catholics. Uh, one of the one of the things that's becoming apparent is is that you see to um to, to to kind of make one's way in the world because they have to raise a family as well they've all this they've all this crucial stuff to do um, they may end up having to avoid professions for which they're brilliantly mm. um, uh, competent and see lesser talents get promotion. But this is going to be hard. I mean, any man or, or woman who's a bit of spirit in them. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're very good at what you do, you, you want a bit of promotion, you want to get, you know, you, you want to reach your full potential. And uh, there, there may well be an element of that. We, we may, for instance, I've been toying with this for a good while. Ten years ago, I'd have said to you, and I'm not sure I was wrong then. I'm not sure, but I, I'm just not sure I'm right either. Ten years ago, I'd have said, watch, follow the Jews. Mostly because of what we did to them. Let's call it. Mm. Okay, because we owe there, big time. Follow the Jews. What did they do? We wouldn't let them own land, wasn't that right? Mm. And we wouldn't trust them in the professions, or most of them. They couldn't teach, they couldn't do it. But Catholics uh, had a huge problem with usury. So we let them do our banking. Um, and the, the Jews, and of course we blamed them for it later, became extremely good at it. Um, they're, they're remarkable people. Try to go into the things where you can't be put out of, that you can't be put out of just because of what you believe. Try to go into areas where if you're good, they can't afford to do without you. Does, does that make sense? Um, there are some areas in which no matter how good you are, they'll get rid of you. Mm. Because they won't allow you to be around if you're... If you're... Now, legally, they probably can't do this. But <laughs> there are a hundred ways to skin a cat like. And by the way, that's... I'm not telling you to skin cats, okay? <laughs> Just... <laughs> we have to be very careful here. Um, so, on the one hand, there may be this white martyrdom. There may be. Mm. Yeah, I guess... a, a loss of being forced into certain areas, even if they're not congenial, hmm. simply because, I mean, I'm sure there were many brilliant Jewish teachers, many brilliant Jewish uh, academics, uh, brilliant lawyers who couldn't practice, all this kind of thing. They, they didn't maybe particularly want to be working in those areas. And would you think, to make a living. for men who already find themselves in certain areas, yeah. do you, and you're under these sort of, as these, these slow ways of being skinned, yeah. um, do you stay and fight it out in a, if you're in a research, if you're a researcher in pharmaceutical areas, or if you're in some of these, as we sort of say, compromised positions now? Okay. Do you stay, or do you think, right, I need to find a different niche? Like, okay. it's a very difficult. Yeah, and, and particularly so if you have a family. Family. Mm. That's difficult, and I, I, I do not say these things lightly. Um, it, it may be useful for you to try to find, how do I say this without? it being misinterpreted, or what the hell it will be anyway. <laughs> um, to find a less principled arrangement. <laughs> In other words, you see, if you're dealing with an ideologically, mm. and that's a lot of organizations right. now, you're in trouble. But if you're dealing with a crowd who just want to make money, then at least you can survive and feed your family, and tomorrow's another day. Do you see where I'm going? So I know much, some yeah. of you are shocked mm. at this. But look, it is time to survive. We're going to have to use our heads here because you have to pick the hill you die on. You can't just go up for every fight, go up mm. for every ball. And, and um, 
Do you want to get involved in an exhausting row early in your career? Right. I, 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 I'd pick love to hear more your, opinions pick, on Pick this. your battles, I say. Yeah. Yeah. Pick your battles. Pick yeah. your battles. Think of your family. Right. Be, be as cute as you can but, be without Because there might also come a day when we need, we need men. We don't want to sort of surrender the ground too cheaply and have yeah. them. We're going to need men and, and Catholics in areas, legal, uh, medical research, yes. precise because these are the hot topic areas. And we're going to need Catholic men who can stand up and defend the faith okay. on a very important issue when the time comes. Okay, um, well, I would say that it's going to be absolutely... You consider, right, you consider a Catholic academic, mm. we're going to have to provide places for them to yes. work and teach, right? Mm. Because they, they get thrown out of a lot of other places. Mm. And that means money, so make money. I know priests like to see lay people making money. Okay, we hope we'll get a little cut. <laughs> but actually, corrupt as I am, and I'm pretty bad, <laughs> I do actually believe in what I'm doing, and I'm saying make money because we're going to need a load of money. You're going to have to, I'm saying this especially to the younger men, you're going to have to set up your own schools. You're going to have to pay your own teacher. We're going to have to set up uh, some third level institutions where are, uh, at least to teach philosophy and theology, where, where young academics can get jobs. We may have to set up a newspaper so the Catholic journalists can get to work. I, the, Right. This is difficult. I wish I could put a better right. spin on it, but... Right. But I do, I do have been said that you know, we can't rely anymore on the structures that have sufficed thus far, so let's be willing, let's be willing to uh, think of how new structures can work again. Again, we sometimes get, I think, trapped in the idea that the church has always been the way it was for the last hundred years, as if the it was always parish structures and things. And that's where you know, awareness that early Irish Catholic church was the monasteries and the hubs, yeah. as you spoke about. Um, so I think we need, we can dare to think of new ways of doing things. Old Archbishop Mannix in Melbourne, uh, Corkman, as you know, uh, a great hero of, of Cardinal Pell. Um, Mannix was against Catholic universities, which is interesting. And Mannix was a frontier bishop, he was a, a former president of Maynooth. He, he just said the modern university is going to be too expensive. Mm. You'll spend all your time fundraising and you'll sell your soul for money, mm. which a lot of them did. So here's another way of doing it. I think he advocated colleges on the periphery of the great universities, halls of residence, additional courses, uh, interpretive and hermeneutic courses, if you like, so that Catholic students were equipped to go into these dens of iniquity and come out on the other side with their faith. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if you can think of better ways of doing this. We, we, our, our crucial problem is that we will not be welcome in many of these institutions, right. and our young right. people will be victimised. So, so how do they make their way? Keeping in mind that most of them won't become priests, they will, be, they will be, become family people, and they will have to think of that at every step. I think, I think one, one thing to be thought of, and... and um, Declan and, and Stephen can weigh in on this, is that we often wait for top-down solutions to problems. Um, and I think at the moment, what we're going to look for is actually bottom-up. It's going to start small. It's not going to be um, a major sort of plan of action that's going to come down from this synod, I think, and oh, once we get that, we can implement it and it'll be all solved. Yeah. Bottom-up, locals, local, local communities, yeah. new, new models of yes. um, community. Um, and there have been, there have been um, examples of this already. Um, yes. Like, I don't know if the, some of you can speak to like, ex experiences you've had of what this looks like on the ground, little, small, starting local ways of living the faith in community. Yeah, I just come in there, I suppose. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I didn't realize it was as dystopian as Father <laughs> Brenton reckons it is. Well, I'll but tell you what, if I'm wrong, good enough. Yeah, that's, yeah. My, but uh, it's better could to... Be, could be, and maybe it is, and maybe it will be, and... Um, yeah. I'm probably just, I'm just like a little lamb there, dancing along to myself there, going, it'll be all right in the night. Anyway, um, hopefully, yeah, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, to be honest. That's why even with the COVID, and all, I'm going, what, what are you on about? What about your soul? Why are you getting no, worked up about no, this yeah. stuff? What about your soul? I mean, what have you done for, for that side of the house in the last week? That's a question I just raised. I mean, it's, listen, that's the way you have to look at it. What have I done? And just... Just finish it. Uh, and there was one particular c case, and I know, see, the lesion this has this bad PR type stuff, 
But it's all about people who, um, not all about it, hasn't done itself favours, we know that. But then there is a kind of a, um, there's a, lot of, there's a kind of a, an influence that doesn't like Our Lady either. That's it. And then there's an influence there that really loves Our Lady and wants Our Lady. And we see this in the streets all the time. And again, my point is, and I say, you know, Frank Duff made a quote when it comes to the pro-life, and I'm not having to say too much about that in, in so far as, he said, listen, it's great for Legion, Legion of Mary, Mary members to be, to be in the pro-life movement um, or whatever they want to do. But do that as individuals, not as Legion of Mary members, and not for the Legion to jump in on that work. And you might say, why would he say that? Now, that's a bit of a... And he said, well, the reason is it's sort of semi-political at one level. I'm just saying what he said. Don't kill me. And the second reason, who's going to reach out to the woman who's made that decision or that whole mess that's come out of it, which has, you know, caused chaos in her life and maybe the family and everything else, the boy who kind of is... He's shoved to one side, doesn't even, you know, no decision... Like it's chaos from a kind of morale, moral point of view for everybody involved there. And so I can see Frank Duff's kind of, hang on a second, who's going to reach out to her? And that's really what I do think, that idea of fellowship, building up society, building up community. We have to, of course, fight those things individually. But I do think Our Lady has some sort of a plan regarding fellowship, you know, army, building stuff up, and that's what really what we're about. So... From our point of view, just to finalise what, finish out what Bruno said, yeah, we've had small victories. I'm not going to, we're not, you know, we're not massively changing the world. But in another, another way, in the same way as that rosary was said this evening, maybe it is St. Joseph, the terror of demons. There was power in that rosary. We go out on the Saturday morning for two hours. We just contact people. We talk to them. We give medals. Suddenly, 10 are out. There's 300 medals given out. You know, maybe say it's a big deal. And say, well, maybe it is a big deal. Maybe it's not a big deal. We don't know what happens with the, from there on in. But in some respects, we do know. We hear people come back. I had one particular case last week, Ian and Pork in the room, they can vouch it. No big deal. But again, a woman came along. I started talking to her. And um, she was from Africa. And she had ch three children there, here. And she was homeless. But she was in a hub. She just said... Um, she kind of recoiled from the medal, really. And I said, how are you getting on? She says, ah, oh, she says, I'm, I'm homeless. I have three children and, uh, you know, she says, uh, uh, I've no one to talk to. That's basically it. I've no one to talk to. And then she started to cry. And I'm like there, okay, what do I do here now? I mean, this is kind of, she's in floods of tears. And it turns out we're just finishing anyway. And I said, uh, listen, we're finishing five minutes here. We're finishing now, she wrap it up, we're all going for a cup of coffee, do you want to come along? Didn't know if she's Buddhist, atheist, Muslim, didn't matter. Came along. Long story short, she spoke to us. Her brother's a priest in Nigeria. And she just said, I've no one to talk to, she said, you know, that's the way it is. So my point is, we can, we can do lots of things, really, and just build up the grace now, so whatever comes down the road, we have a bank. That's all I can say, and to make that suggestion, reach out to people, there's lots of marginalised people out there, they need a lift, they need an uplift. We go and talk to them, bring our lady into their life. That's where our hands and feet, that's what the Lord wants us to do, is the mystical body. So we keep working that game. The other game is gonna, that'll kind of, we'll have to adapt to it, we have to bob and weave, but I think the Holy Spirit will help us, that's all I'd say. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I suppose when you listen to us talk between it, you know, sometimes it's hard to get away from the negative stuff that you forget the positive stuff. I'm a, a couple of years younger than, um, the smelly cheese. The lads, but, um, but I always think of that, um, there's a line from The Simpsons, you know, where Ned Flanders' parents bring him to the psychiatrist, you know, and they say, uh, they're beatniks, and they say, oh, we've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. And um, look, I, I'm, I haven't had a window into the church my whole life, but um, I feel like that was, my, that was my impression of lots of things that... Uh, there's so many simple things there, even Father Brendan pointed out that education and, and media and simple things that have been left by the wayside, people relying on structures that have always been there rather than being proactive and so on. And I was reading an article the other day, it was in the Wall Street Journal, 
and it was talking about South America, and it was talking about how Brazil especially was going to become majority evangelical mm. in, in, in the next year or two. Yeah. And it's interesting because if we're talking about the synod coming up, um, you know, in my spare time for my sins, I like to listen to some of the podcasts about the synod <laughs> that some of the more liberal mm. groups in the church are coming up with. And to be fair to them, I mean, look, they're talking about it, but uh, you get people on it talking, and I hope people can understand where I'm coming from here. I'm not giving out about these people, but you get people who had been to South America as missionaries, and of course, obviously, we've, we've Af Afi Lam, who was a big success uh, when he went, but you have people who come back, and they talk about how they had enculturation, and you know, they mixed in with the culture and all these other things. And what kind of startles me is then they start saying, we should use these models as a model for our church here. And you kind of say, well, okay, but everyone's leaving that church over there, so why would we use that model? And there was a line in the article that said, the church became a church of the poor, um, or the church reached out to the poor and the poor all became Protestant. And so you're kind of saying to yourself, well, why would we imitate that here? And I think uh, as Irish people, and probably not everyone in the room is Irish, or everyone, um, who might watch this after, but but from our perspective in Ireland, like what Declan was talking about there, um, like I, this is, this is, like I've had people stop me on the street who were Protestant and ask me to talk about their faith. I even had, I've actually had Mormons stop me more times than Catholics. I didn't even know there was any Mormons in Ireland, but they, they stopped me more times than Catholics. <laughs> you know, the only time, like I, I was going back to Mass for a long time, and I never had anybody approach me. And actually, the one time someone approached me um, was actually someone asked me to join the Legion. And that was the only time, so that's, <laughs> that's why I'm here. But I suppose the thing is, uh, when I look at Ireland, you know, I think Frank Duff had an essay called The Mass, A Thrilling Adventure. And Frank Duff was always caught up in this idea of um, adventurousness and entrepreneurship and, and excitement and risk in your life and a few weeks a few months back someone sent me a book um it was called last words and it was the um i think the opw published it and it was uh it had all the last letters of all the easter rising leaders and it was an incredible thing to read because it was the lack of fear that was in all of the letters and the sense of the fact that they were all so assured that what they were doing was right, and the fact that they could see so clearly. Like Father Brendan was saying earlier, sometimes the evil see very clearly. Well, if people are really pure and rely on God, they can see very clearly too. And if they're willing, if they're willing to die, and they're willing to give up their life and sacrifice something, sometimes you can see very clearly too. And I think of how quickly that happened, how quickly it turned that they had that ambition to do what they did, and then the fearlessness uh, before they died. Things are bad now in Ireland, but things can change very quick. And the Legion, I've only been around the Legion a few years, and what amazes me is how much like, success you can have so quickly with people in terms of getting them praying again, or getting them back to mass, or whatever their own personal problems will be. So. When Father Brennan was starting to speak, he said, you know, with the synod coming up, the first thing you have to start with really is personal sanctification. So you have to pray and fast. Then the other things come after it. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of us here tonight and it's great. Like if you think, you know, four years ago when there was the, um, the Aztec, it was kind of an Aztec-like human sacrifice uh, ritual in Dublin Castle when they were celebrating abortion. You know, four years later, um, people are still together, people are still praying. And, you know, we have to visualize, if you think to yourself a hundred years ago, like Frank Duff wrote an essay in the 70s about how he thought that people in Ireland weren't going to mass enough. He said if you went to most masses during the week, it was actually empty. So we think there's something happened in the 2000s, but he says if you actually went to most weekday masses in the 70s, it was actually more or less empty. And he said the Sunday one was the big one, but he said, because um, you know, he was, I suppose he was thinking in his head, well, you know, 100 years earlier, or 150 years earlier, he still had the penal laws or whatever. So, you know, this has been coming on 50, 60 years. And the thing about it is, 
it's been slowly, slowly rotten away, and that's how kind of the culture ended up the way it is now. But we, we have a lot to offer, and as Father Brendan was saying, like, there's no philosophy underpinning what's there. I mean, it's not like communism. Under communism, it's very hard to defeat it because there is a strong philosophy behind it. Um, but the philosophy that, that our society has, you know, just trying to turn us into a, a mini America or a mini, you know, whatever other countries, Star it, hmm. Starbucks, hmm. yeah, like that's, you know, that's, um, that's, that's not in the fear. That's not in the fear. We have something a lot richer to offer and right. I think we should be very proud of our heritage, very proud of, of the faith that's gone before us in this country and we should, um, you know, look to, look to each other. And the, the big thing, I think, as Declan was saying, the big thing I've noticed in the church is personal contact. Like even you guys um, being here tonight and, and having a cup of tea beforehand. And these are little things, but it's something we have to offer that the rest of the world doesn't. And it was the thing about Mass when, when Mass was gone and people say, I can watch Mass online. Well, you know, you have to, you have to be there to receive the Eucharist when you can. And, right. you know, so... I definitely, your comment there that we have much to offer, I think that's very true, and we know that, but surprisingly, all those who seem preoccupied with the world, when you present it to them, they will know that too. So we were, in preparing for this conference, we were talking um, on the phone, and we brought up that one of the great Catholic writers of the 20th century was J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, I believe it was the best-selling book of the century. Most of the people who read it didn't know that it was infused with Catholicism, but it was, deeply so. That's why it was so good. And the people were, who, all those people who read that were attracted to that. It resonated with them. And I think that's what we have to offer people. Even before we mention Christ, we have so much to hold out. Um, and that's the first step. I think we might say, like you, you talked about, we need to do spiritual training. We need to prepare. I think we need to sort of till the soil and fertilize it a bit before we plant the seed. I think we can all be very eager to go out and like mention Mary and mention Christ, but there is preparatory work that needs to be done, I think, yeah? Absolutely. I, I think, look, um, groups like Opus Dei are very good at this. They're, they emphasize it very strongly. In some ways, the greatest evangelization is just being really good at what you're doing and somebody discovering that you're a Catholic. Mm. Tolkien doesn't mention God in that whole book. Mm. And he didn't, he didn't, as you know, he didn't agree with C.S. Lewis yes. making, he felt, he felt it was a bit too obvious. Too heavy-handed. Yeah. Too heavy-handed. Mm. Um, but he was clear in interviews that it was Catholic from beginning to end, and especially in the revisions. It was consciously and intentionally Catholic. He doesn't mention God at all. I see that book has brought more people to God than we'll ever know, mm. you know? Mm. But obliquely, you know, it's right. starting from far out. Right. So I think we can take this, I, 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 I'm struck by, you know, you were mentioning um, A Brave New World, which maybe captured more accurately how authoritarianism mm. doesn't always take the model of communism. And like, so we might say like brainwashing today, you're not being strapped down in a chair and mm. knocked full of drugs and, and played a, a reel of Stalin or something. It's occurring through the smartphones, through TV, through all the media. So I think before we ever have a hope of mentioning Christ or mentioning Mary, well, we're going to have to get our, our, our family members, our brothers, our, our sons away from the screens first and foremost. And that takes place by, it doesn't mean you have to take them to church, take them fishing, take them gardening. Um, like we're going to have to prepare our, our sons and our, our, our fellow men to yeah. receive the message, yeah? Yeah. And uh, a key thing about the, the brainwashing, it never stops. Mm. It really is, I, I mean, I do strongly recommend that, that, that just, if you've, if you've time sometime, just, fl just flick on Netflix. I say, it's, it's really quite astonishing. And it's the same ideology coming across to the extent that you have a film about Vikings and you have Viking bands led by women. Mm, mm. And I mean, the references, my understanding is that the references to that in the Norse sagas are so Obscure. oblique. Mm. That, uh, but there they are, right. these right. terrifying women. Right. Right. <laughs> who are leading the way. And, and, and so women are put into places, uh, and there's no need to do that to show how great women are. But that's what's being done. Yes. There's no difference. 
there are no different, uh, you iron out all the differences, but the differences are precious. I think it's an important element. I think it's usually the first stage in most of the spiritual writers, St. Ignatius of Loyola and those always talk the first week is always that sort of conversion. The conversion is the turning away from the world first. Yes, there is a turning towards Christ, but we have to be very conscious of turning away from the world um, and, and help others to do that first and foremost. Maybe also in, in thinking of, of training and preparing, what, what virtues, what, what characteristics of men maybe need to be most emphasized? I think at different points in history, different things need to be uh, valued. Um, certainly one that comes to mind for me, I think, is we need to cultivate perseverance. Yeah. Because there's no quick fix here. And anyone who sort of thinks, well, I'll go out and I'll strive, if he hasn't got a reserve tank there, it's going to peter out. We're going to be in need to be in this for the long haul. So perseverance is one. Is there other, other characteristics you, you see as needed? Or? A few weeks ago there, I went up to the, uh, you know, the men's rosary rallies up in, um, it was in Armagh. You know, we, we all knelt and prayed the rosary here beforehand. But there was something interesting anyways about the idea of having it out in, in public. I think men kind of have to be taught a little bit to, um, to not be afraid to kind of discuss their faith in public. But in, I think stuff like this helps you kind of interact with people in a, in a good kind of normal way that you're more comfortable doing it because I think especially if you kind of, um, if you're new to it, sometimes you kind of want to blurt stuff out and you end up getting aroused with people and so on and so forth, you know? But I think in terms of virtue, I think learning more about the faith yourself is a good way to go. So I think, like, I don't know about other people here, but you have the internet now and you have YouTube and you have a Fulton Sheen app or you can have whatever mm. and you can right. just stick those on. and th Because that's the first thing people want to know. Why do you do this? Why do you think that? Why do you teach this? Do you know what I mean? So I think if uh, I say to people, talk, talk to other people and half the time you're not going to be able to tell people the deepest answers, but you can tell people like Declan said, he met someone and she was crying or you can tell someone I was volunteering at the hostel and we this guy come in and this is how he was after it, you know? So I think getting out there, meeting other people, and uh, that helps you kind of hold your own in those conversations, you know, because people will always, always listen to that, you know? Yeah, just to come in there, I think, um, I think these kind of events are important, to be honest. Not that we've done too many of them, but we're going to need this kind of stuff because people go, actually, I don't feel abnormal as I stand in the church on my own. I feel okay. They seem half normal. Brendan's a bit smellier than me, um, but that's okay, we're, we're getting there. But I mean, we are normal, like, I mean, we're just, um, we're just not buying, what's the public enemy, the band, the rap band back in 1989 or something, I don't believe the hype, and that's basically, we just don't believe the hype, and that comes to secularism really, not going into the COVID thing, just saying, but we believe our Lord's hype, really, we believe our Lady's plan, our Lord's plan, and we're just trying to keep a third eye on it. And the world wants to distract us all the time. And that's basically the game, should we say. So we have to say, turn off the phone, turn off the Netflix, get into the car, give my daughter, my, one thing I do, I give my daughter a lift, but I say a few decades of the rosary, just keeping the prayer tipping over, you know, just keeping at it and not an overly force away. I'm, not, I'm sure she might even, you know, she'd be embarrassed even, even saying that maybe, but. You know, she's 19, you know, she's, uh, she's not saying, she's not running out the door, like she's, we're, we're, we're talking. And I think that's it, you just keep talking and asking questions. That's one thing said, someone said about a dinner party conversation. If you ask a question, you, you dictate the, the, the conversation, really, you know, and I think it's worthwhile raising questions. Not in an overly, you can't say, listen, I want to talk about Jesus now, do you mean, but, you know, What's going on here? You know, where is the, what's the purpose of this? I met, I went for a walk last week with a neighbor of mine who's probably agnostic, atheist, I don't know, he's searching anyway, and um, 52, 53, you know, and he said, I actually gave him that quote, you know, I said, religion is tough. He says, so what? I said, religion is tough. And it should be tough, I said, it's meant to be tough. Well, wh wh why? Because you're trying to save your soul. I'm only quoting Frank Duff, but is it, this, is, this is a big game here. So it's not going to be that easy. So you need to put a shift in. And he's looking at me going, OK, I never, no, no one ever said that before. I said, yeah, that's why. It's, it's not that easy. But it's great. 
It is a great adventure, like a thrilling adventure. You know, it is a great, it's a fulfillment, the, the whole thing. Like the arts, drama, film, life, death. We can face anything, you know what I mean? And then I look at people who don't have it and they're, I don't have a go, like, but it's kind of fairly two dimensional, you know what I mean? Where am I going on holidays? Or that's rolling from one situation to another, which is, listen, that's their thing. Just trying to encourage them, say, listen, there is more to life, you're made for more. Mm. Get in the game, you know what I mean? This is important. You've only got one life, time is going by. They say land is precious. <laughs> Father Brandon would know this, you know I mean? They're not making any more. Yeah, no. yeah, well, yeah. I'd add in, they're not no. making any more time either. Right. No. You know, you've only got one, one go at this. So, you know, make it, make it as generous as you can be and make it as positive as you can be and smile, actually. That's another one. Father Michael Marr used to say, he came to a Legion conference years ago. He said, smile. Give your face a holiday. <laughs> you know, let's have a laugh. You had a great podcast before Christmas. Catholics like to party. <laughs> that was a great one. And no. in fairness, I won't go on to back to that, but I just say, we, you know, we are very normal. We'll have a laugh as much as anybody else, more, more so. So you have to have a bit of, uh, bit of a smile, a bit of a humour. There are funny things happen. Funny things happen in Legion and stuff as well, to be honest. And it's just, you just laugh really at the world in some respects. And just, not like in Egypt, but just kind of go, you know, listen, we've got good news here. We've got the spirit. We're doing our best. We're plugging along. We're showing up. We're turning up. And we're just doing a bit of work. That's yeah. it. Uh, I'd, I'd follow up on that ju just because that's excellent. But just, just add to it, um, study. Know what you're doing. Know what you're talking about. Duff was a great studier. Mm. All mm. his life, as I understand it, and mm. the handbook was written by a man who had a serious knowledge of theology. But Duff was a first-class civil servant. That's often forgotten. He was civil servant under the Brits and later under the Free State. He was excellent mm. at his work. Um, another thing is, and following on from what you're saying, or to repeat it, develop a sense of humour. Uh, human beings all over the world, there's nothing like laughing with somebody. Not at them, but sharing a laugh to share a joke, and the, 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 the guy or the woman who can, the, especially to be able to face life, because it can be tough, but to be able to face life with a bit of, a bit of style. Mm. The Italians used to call it sprezzatura. It's a great word, sprezzatura. It was the ability to face any disaster and make a joke about it. Light a cigarette, <laughs> you'll have that. <laughs> the house burned down like the hay shed. Everything right. gone. <laughs> but at least, thanks be to God, you still have the fags. <laughs> and I think, I think the best Catholics I know, that's, they're attractive personalities. Yeah. People are drawn to the saints. Even, you know, Padre Pio, they said, could be a holy terror in the confessional. Yeah. But people were drawn to him. There was something attractive about Earthy. him. And I, yeah, yes, it and I think, let's be the people that people want to have coffee with or stand at the water cooler with and chat with, because that's how we'll start to communicate the faith to them. But they'll just want to be around us because we're attractive personalities, because we're fully alive, fully human. I think that's, I think that's where we begin. Yeah. That's where we begin. You know, um, I was thinking, maybe just one point, we're, we're all he we're, we're here for Our Lady. Uh, many of the men here are, are men of the Legion. Um, they're dedicated to this woman in their lives. Um, and I, I sort of agree with you. I think I'd be confident in saying that there's not a man in this room who, if he wasn't at that, if he was at that canal during the week, wouldn't have laid down his life yeah. for that woman. Um, and so I think it can be sometimes more obvious how to die for someone. Yeah. How do we live for the women in our lives? There you go. Um, I would argue back, okay, I'm speaking as a celebrant priest now, but I, 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 would, I would argue back strongly is that men need, you see, Christian civilization, and all right, to an extent that did exist once, Christian civilization gave us something that civilizes the war between the sexes. <laughs> because they're two very, very different ways of being human, and yet both human. You know, they're complementary, but there's, there, there's a jar, it was chivalry. Mm. It put manners on men. It taught them to behave themselves and to revere women and protect them and reverence them. And I, I'd say go back to that again. I, I can't understand, 
I mean, the, again, just speaking like, you know, because uh, I'm not saying I'd have been any good at it, but I had to give that side of life up. And I can't understand a man who doesn't buy his wife flowers. Or some clown who goes, goes abroad and comes back with some stupid present instead of spending money he doesn't have on some expensive perfume. And of course, she'd give out to him for a week, but she'd love it. Right. I, I don't know. I, 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 just, I, just, I just, I envy married men. And for God's sake, will you just, you, you have your wife not to love her, you have her to adore her. Okay, she is to be adored, showered with presents. Okay, I, I, I'm just saying, what do I know? Just a stupid little maybe, priest. Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll ask the married man with the 19-year-old daughter, how do you... Yeah. Do you concur with that assessment? I'm going to stop on the spar at uh, a service station on the way home, pick up flowers <laughs> uh, and chocolates and the whole lot. Uh, your question was, how do we live with women? Uh, no, how do we live for them? I think it's, we often imagine that we would readily die for them. How do we live for the women in our lives? As men? Like. Well, I think it's really important. One thing, actually, really, uh, I, I'm slightly digressing here, but uh, I met the head of a prominent congregation, and her, my daughter was in her school, you know, and she said, oh, yeah, she was academic, fairly uh, academic school, you know. And I said, you know, it's great that the academics are kind of high there. I said, uh, but, um, you know, not everybody can become a lawyer or a, a, or a doctor. And she kind of looked at me, this kind of quizzical nun, you know, kind of, well, what's that about? I said, well, not everybody can, like, I mean, what about motherhood? And she kind of jumped nearly when I said that to her, and I said, well, I know that, you know, it's not something that's on an, an 18 or 17, 18 year old girl's radar, but if it's not proposed out there as sort of a, a, a way of fulfillment in life, um, well, maybe that's something that needs to be taught about. And, mm. You know, at the end of the day, if we don't have mothers, we don't have families, and we don't have a we don't a domestic church. It's a family, so um, I think that's one thing that could be kind of highlighted. And I would be talking about that at home. I'd be saying, yeah, careers and job fine, but you know, meeting the right lad is really important. You know, that's really that's the A game um, in my head anyway. I'm not just sure it's in her head or my wife's head. Going back to the wife question. Yeah, I think respecting motherhood is important, to be honest, and their role. They're they are serious operators. I mean, we're only here. We're not... This is man up to help women. That's what we're really... That's what this is about. They've carried a lot of the load, really. Mm. Like, men, even, like, that idea, like, I'll, I'll go and ask herself, you know what I mean? Mm. Tom said it last month when someone came around from the pro-life. He did work pro-life work. And the fella at the door, he said, um, uh, what way are we voting to the wife? You know what I mean? Sort of as if... You know, come on. Have you not got your own kind of ideas uh, in relation to this sort of stuff? So what's my point? My point is I think you have to respect motherhood, respect women. And like that whole chastity area is a real problem. And like a lot of it, the men are really letting down the women. You know what I mean? I don't care what anyone says. But I sat one day at a, at a, at a, a meeting actually with the same nun and a present bishop, who sure a name nameless, and we're moved, going into the meeting. Department of Education, and I was sitting there at the Gresham, Toddy's Bar, and there was a couple going by, and they were holding their hands. So that's interesting. Kind of, it's Count Street here, it's not really the, the Champs Elysees um, um, for, ro for romance. And then another couple went by, and she was holding, they were holding hands again. I said, okay. Ten minutes later, I'm a bit bored now listening to the present bishop and the nun yapping on here, so I'm kind of watching out the window. And I see another couple, and I said, yeah, this must be a couple's convention. What, or is it the Jehovah, Jehovah Witness? Sometimes they're very, obviously, couple-y, you know what I mean? They're kind of, they're very clean living, and they're there, and I kind of, oh, maybe it's a couple, you know. And I'm not joking, then I saw another couple go by, and then I was looking at the faces, and I seen kind of a, maybe a good-looking South American, Brazilian girl, maybe, with a, an Irish lad there. I said, what's going on here? And I was looking at the Irish lad's face, and then when she, she went, his face kind of fell. And I said, bang, I've got it. I was in the Gresham Hotel, and Planned Parenthood was next door, or whatever, family planning clinic, and whatever it is. That's what's going on. They're getting this sorted. And there's the fellas, and, you know, let's get this sorted. So they're the ones that really let down 
the mothers as well. Maybe they didn't have any choice, all that kind of stuff. I'm not having a go at it, but I mean, I'm just saying it. That's a, it's, a, it's that drinking, GAA, culture, drugging, whatever it is. Not even drinking anymore. It's kind of drugging, isn't it, really? So I don't know. But I think there's a, there's a bit of responsibility there. The lads are letting, them, letting the, the, the girls down, I think. I, I think there is maybe an element of we feel like it's not our area anymore to say. Like, you, you know, if, well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a member of the clergy. I, you know, maybe I should be talking about this. Or I'm the man in this relationship. It's a woman's <coughs> issue. Yeah. We shouldn't say anything. I think, I think we need to get over ourselves hmm. and, and face up to the fact, yes, we may get some flack for it. But if it's the right thing to say, if it's the soul worth saving, say it. Do it. Uh, be chivalrous. You might be sort of spat at, well, maybe not spat at, but uh, scorned, uh, told you're old fashioned, in a thousand different ways, as you said, that they can maybe demean you. But if it's the right thing to do, if it's the way to be men, then let's do it. And, you know, for every I, time you, it, it, it won't work, there'll be that one time where it will, and won't it be worth it to have saved that one, yeah. the one soul or something? I would, um, I'd seriously question a lot of the mentoring that goes on as well. Mm. Is, um, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really have much confidence in it uh, spiritually or morally, to be honest, to say the least. But fine, there's, there's nothing we can do about those organizations. We can do, do something about ourselves. It's, it's the, key thing, the key thing with a man is that, as to you, you know, the American phrase, he's a promise keeper, mm. so that he's faithful to his wife. You know, is that he's faithful to his wife. And, and look, I, I remember saying this to classes as a priest. I said, you know, you get married to this beautiful girl. What if she gets sick? It happens. Well, well what then? Well, you just get rid of her. You just walk out. What if she, she loses her looks? What if, what if she ends up in a wheelchair? And you've, I've seen this. It happens. But to real people in their lives. And so the, the romance I'm talking about costs everything. Mm. But... Right, I like the idea of being, being a man of your word. Well, yeah. we should be men of the word. Yeah. Um, and even more so. Um, ab ab yeah. Absolutely. I, one of the things that worried me about the church during COVID, we weren't doing anything crazy for the most part. The, there, there's no creativity. There was no imagination. There was none of the richness and creativity that characterizes Catholicism mm. sporadically through the ages. We weren't doing anything really daft or almost or dignified to try to make sure that people could get mass. I mean, hardly anyone was coming up with... I'd have loved to see a bishop come up with some totally ridiculous idea. But, you know, but just to make sure that everyone could get mass without, right. without trouble, right. like, you know? Right. But, I, I don't know, we... We managed it very safely, and again, look, it's not, I mentioned bishop, I'm not getting to the bishops, I, the priests more so. We, we managed it very safely, very efficiently, but the romance has died. Mm. Uh, if, <laughs> and I don't want you to get nervous. <laughs> but uh, if, if I were the laity, I wouldn't be feeling the love. Mm. I'd mm. put it that way. Mm. Now, okay, there are exceptions to that, in fairness, because some priests really went the extra mile, but I just didn't see enough... Um, enough of us in the priesthood saying, I'm going to keep my word. Right, those are the rules, and I'm just going to find a way, no matter how stupid I end up looking, or how close to sacrilege and blasphemy we end up going. I am going to get mass to God's people. Mm. If they want it, mm. I'm going to get mass mm. to them. And I didn't see that happening mm. much. There were bits and bobs, but I didn't see it happening. Mm. And I, I thought to myself, right. Crikey, but uh, maybe that, 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 that attitude is needed across the board in various different, for the layman, the word you made at the altar to yeah. your wife, the, um, how many men have been godparents yeah. to their, maybe it's their, maybe it's not their own child, maybe it's their, 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 their niece or their nephew. Yeah. You said something at that baptismal font. You did. Like, however outlandish way you have to go about getting the faith into your niece or nephew's life, try all the tricks in the book, but try something. My, yeah. my grandfather, the Lord to mercy on him, was a tough male farmer. He was a World War I veteran. Although his friends used to accuse him of hiding in the kitchen. He was a cook, corporal, or sergeant, I think. If you, and he could swear like a docker, but he never blasphemed. 
If you took the name of the Lord in front of him, he was a short man, short, thick set. He'd take off his, you know the flat caps they were? Mm. He'd take mm. off his cap, he was bald as a coot. He'd take off his cap and he'd stare at you until you stopped using the holy name. Mm. Then he'd put the cap back on and he'd go on talking as if you hadn't talked. That's male piety, boy. Mm. The only ones now, the only place now you'll see that is with, is with the Muslims or some of the Orthodox Jews, the Haredi. That's about it. It's the real male piety and, and the romance and everything else is, I, I, I think something in it is lost. And, and when a Catholic man is no longer proud to kneel before his God, then I don't think, I can't see him being much good of a husband either. Do you know what I mean? There's no, there's no death, romance and sacrifice in him. It's died in him. Something has died in the guy. Jeepers, you'd hardly blame her for taking the road, like, you know? <laughs> but I like, I like that example, especially because it shows, you know, how many homilies and sermons have you forgotten I know. that you don't remember? I know. That you wouldn't, you know, great, great spiritual teachings in them, but it's all gone. Yeah. That one moment by that, uh, by your grandfather taking off his hat, that's embedded in you. Yeah. That's the, that's the way Catholicism will be handed down. And that's the way every man in this room can do that. He doesn't have to get up and give a, give a homily or give a talk. But little gestures, your, your, your sons are watching, your grandsons are watching, they're taking note of it. And they will remember it when they're 30 and 40. Um, I used to see the old men praying in the church when I was a kid, and the men were on one side and the women mm. on the other. That continued for some time, as you, as you, you, you don't remember. Heard, but heard it stories did. about it. It did, yeah. Oh, it, continued to, it continued into the 70s. And a lot of them died out in the 70s. And they'd rock back and forward praying. And you'd hear them, because they were used to the Mass being in Latin. So they'd just bash away themselves. And you'd hear them every so often, oh my Jesus. <laughs> and you'd think somebody was after him, dying at the back of the church. And no, he was only halfway through his devotion. <laughs> they, were, they were phenomenal. Do you know where I saw that? The only time I saw that as a, as a grown man. Because they, they died, mm, as I mm, said, out in the mm. 70s, that, that, that old generation. Mm. I, after I was ordained a deacon in Rome, we got into John Paul II's mass. And it was the only time after that I saw a man pray with his whole body, like John a man. Paul. And John Paul was there, oh, <clears throat> in the seat, and he had the rosary beads, and he had a pile of posties with names written on them. People would ask him to pray for them. The whole thing was chaotic, like, and he was there. Jeepers, he was dogging into it. And he was an athletic man, you know. He still was, that was about uh, two, that was um, 91. And all right, you know, mm. he's had his health trouble, but he was still, still a vigorous man. He was still yeah. a powerfully built man. And every so often, hallelujah. <laughs> and he sort of settle himself in the chair again. <laughs> and I thought, Jeepers, this guy's serious. <laughs> I was so proud of him. I was, I was so proud for my relations to see him. And he was praying like the old men used to when I was a kid, and I'm sure they did in Poland, because I think a big influence on him was the local tailor, Jan Tiranowski, who was a mystic. He was kind of very, very like Duff, except not as well educated, I think, maybe. I don't think. So, look, I, I think it's doable. I think it's doable, but... We have to work out a way to do this as men. Yeah. You know, I'm not coming across with any macho nonsense either. I mean, it's what we are. It won't, nothing else is convincing. And our piety is too feminized. And, and um, the hymns are too feminine. And I'm not getting at women. A woman is a woman, a man is a man. I, I just, men need a hymn that you can roar. You know, um, a battle chant, yeah. You mm. need something that you can dance with the tribe to, like, you know, that you can roar. I, re I remember a friend of mine telling me he bought a, he bought a set of knives in, in Rhines in Galway. And the guy in Rhines started laughing and he said, Do you know, he said, I can never sell those to women. <laughs> he said, The only people who buy blocks of knives and iron pots are men. <laughs> he said, The women wouldn't be bothered because the pots are too heavy. <laughs> But he said, a man it's would weighty, buy knives yeah. and a pot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and his ideas run out after that. Yes. <laughs> and we, we, we have to do this as men. I, 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 we do. We have to rediscover it and, and develop a new male piety for a new age. 
so maybe one last question then. Um, just you, you mentioned there, we have to do it as men, but I recognize that maybe in our eagerness and maybe the fact that we've lived so long under a feminized church and a feminized culture, we're not sure. Maybe our role models did die out. The, the generation passed, maybe a lot of them. Um, so the danger of pitfalls. What, what are the potential pitfalls? Are there any that immediately crop to mind? Things to avoid maybe that, that you know, in, our, in our earnest efforts or in our zeal that might trip us up accidentally? We sell out to the world and we adopt models uncritically uh, that are admired by the world. So the macho thing. That's not worth a damn to us. And it's a, an immature adolescent thing anyway. Right. Uh, there's much more to being a man than that. I, 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 I think we have to take a critical attitude towards, towards those models. I, I, I think that's, that's certainly an issue. Interesting the way the Catholic schools have foundered. Um, the very name they've got for, for being excellent has been the ruin of them. Most Catholic schools are first class. They're excellent at getting people into the professions, into the thing. Mm. They're supposed to get you to heaven. Mm. There's an old monk in Amperfort, a past pupil of Amperfort told me this, you know the famous school in England? Yes, by the Conference. Yeah. An old monk, he, the first time they were asked at the headmaster's conference in England, a very, very upper class affair, Eton, the whole bit like, and finally they were asked to it. And they were asked to say in one word what they were producing their students for. And they went around the table, around the, the room. And they were all saying, you know, service and duty and all the rest of it. And this little monk got up and he said, death. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Right. That's true. But our, our, our schools have become, I'm not getting at teachers, by the way. I'm not getting at, this is huge. It's bigger than any one person or group. They've become worldly. Mm. They're not crazy. Mm. They're not funky. They're not. Am I making any sense? Yeah, no, They're perfect. Yeah, no, it's, a, a Catholic school speech. should be a weird little place. Right. No, but it should be full of creative right. people, artistic, scientific. It should, should be full of briery, difficult little people. Because you know? we don't belong, as you said we earlier. Don't we don't belong. And our school shouldn't belong, and our hospital shouldn't belong, and our, you know, our families, in some sense, shouldn't belong, because they're not of this world, ultimately. I remember when we still had the boarding in Jarlitz, we were at a priest meeting. We lost it in 05 one of the oldest boarding schools in the country. And uh, a few priests, a few of us were, went for a, a cup of coffee afterwards. And, and some, we were in a pub and one of the priests had a pint. And he's a poet. He, no, he, he died lately. He was, a pub, he was a poet, a real intellectual. But he was there sipping his pint. And he asked one of the priests who was in the college, he said, so how's the college? And uh, as every Jarlis past pupil asks, you know, how are things in the college? And, and he said, oh, good, he said. Gee, he said, we, we're getting the right stuff, he said. We're getting fine, solid guys. And your man put down his pint and stared at him. Safe, solid people build safe, solid, suicidal societies. And he picked up the pint and started drinking it. <laughs> well, my friend was fit to chew the step. Because <laughs> the work that goes into a boarding school. Mm. But he, he was right. Catholic schools should be a bit crazy, you know? But we, we saw, th this is it, selling out. That's, that's my biggest worry. Sorry. And gentlemen, any particular worry or concern? Um, Closing comment even. Well, I was just gonna say, I heard, I heard Father Brendan speak a few months ago and he, I don't know if he remembers making this comment. He got excited then, and uh, talking about schools, and he said, because he was talking about the industrial schools and so on and so forth. And what he said was, I don't know if he said this in jest, but I, I thought it was a very good comment. He said something along the lines of, he would love to give back all the best schools and take some of the most difficult ones and then really show what Catholic education was about. And yeah. uh, I think that's very true. And the safety thing, I mean, there's people who run this country now who, um, you know, can't stand the church, go against the church in every way. They went to the best Catholic schools, you know? And so sometimes you just need, you just need a spark. It, it, like Fulton Sheen said, if you want your child to lose their faith, send them to the Catholic school. If you want them to learn to fight for their faith, send them to a public school. And so, you know, we're, 
we're blessed the one way we've lots of Catholic schools, but in some I ways... I hadn't heard that quotation. That's excellent. Yeah. That's very interesting. In some ways, it's, it's almost counterproductive, you know, so yeah. we ju that's, where, that's where a bit of um, education, a bit like self-education and a bit of spiritual discipline comes into play to allow ourselves to see that clearly and to, to actually say, okay, well, if we have to give up X amount of schools and do it for a purpose, not just say, yeah, take the schools, mm. we don't mm. care. Because that's, that's what some of them are saying now, just take right. the schools, take them off our hands, too much money. But if we kind of say, take the schools, because we are going to go all in on these schools or right. this plan of action, that's the way to mm. do it. And it's like the guy with the, throwing over the China Cups, you know? I mean, mm. we know the China Cups of, of the education system in Ireland are going to break, but I think we just have to uh, you know, do it for a reason and have a plan of how we come out of it. Because, mm. um, you know, it, as we said, in most countries, people would want to go to a Catholic school anyway. So there's no right. need to fear. And it could be a very exciting avenue. And to go back to, I mentioned Parik Pierce earlier. Mm. I mean, great, a great headmaster, great he, he was, Yeah, he was, he was a visionary and he was um, mm. really taught outside the box. And so I think um, that's what we always have to offer. We're, we're always the, um, you know, the, the, a few years ago, I'll just finish on this real quick. A few years ago, there was um, an event in New York in the Met Gala in New York, and it was a fashion event. And lots of people were giving out stink because a lot of the celebrities were dressed up in stuff that was influenced by the, the Catholic imagination. And some people thought it was meant to make fun of us. Now, Cardinal Dolan actually went, and I'm, I'm pretty sure people were giving out about him going, but the idea was supposed to be that they were celebrating the influence, that the weirdness of, of the Catholic faith, and in, in when it's, because it's otherworldly. And so if you look back, some of them were a bit crass, maybe. But some of them actually really, some of the designers obviously really got the idea that Catholicism is something otherworldly and it's um, something that really has a creative impetus that I think we've lost. And we just need to get it back again, you know? Yeah. Declan? No. I think we'll leave it there. And Well, since we were, um, we were referencing a lot of movies earlier on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in my own two cents on that. I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the movie Patton. Oh, yeah. Listening to Father Brendan speak, yeah. I would know nothing other in my head than George C. Scott. Uh, George C. Scott's opening speech. And uh, it's very powerful, and everyone leaves that speech wanting to go out and take those Nazis by the throat and, and, and deal with them. Mm -hmm. uh, very, I think we all feel very much the same way, uh, motivated, uh, fired up. And, and uh, uh, the, the military historian, Victor, uh, David, uh, Victor David, ha Davis Hanson, um, David Hanson, he, he, he reckons that war could have been ended if they gave Patton his head maybe six months earlier. Yeah. But he slapped that soldier. And yes, PC. And, and as he said, PC. a therapeutic society. They actually let how many die because just to punish him. Right. But, but uh, there we are. Right. There's a, there's, I think there's a, there's a line to some effect in that, in that opening speech where he says, when you're sitting on your porch, 50 years from now, and you take your grandson on your knee, he's going to ask you, what did you do, granddaddy, in, in, in the Great World War? And are you just going to look at him and say, well, I shoveled shit in Louisiana? You're going to, many of you will have grandsons, and you'll be having them on, their, on your knee, and they're going to ask you, what did you do when, you know, uh, the shit hit the fan in the Catholic Church in Ireland? Putting it crassly, but that's how Patton did it. And you better have a good answer for him. We'll leave it there. Thank you.